right. All right, I'm loving it. Perfect. Okay, nice. All right, guys, let's do it. Are you guys ready for this? Let's do it. Okay, so hi, everyone. Good evening. Uh, good morning. <laughs> Whatever you are. My name is Camilo Villegas. I am a full stack developer. Uh, I have been doing this for a couple of years, probably four or five years in the industry. I always had a passion for programming and um, here that is about to end. Hey, hello, Arnold from Cameroon. I hope everything is fine there. So uh, one of my goals for this year was to teach. I said, okay, I think I know uh, my fair amount of technology. I want to teach this knowledge. And I found four gigs. I became a mentor. I'm very proud to say that I was the teacher of Miami cohort 52, where most of the students are positioned now and having good earnings. And I'm really happy to be impacting lives. After being a mentor, four gigs invites me uh, once in a while, probably once a month to do these kind of workshops. All right, so the main idea for these workshops are uh, for you to get involved into coding, right? It's, it's not that you, as I was saying, deliver a full solution and understand every single detail, but if you can uh, leave this workshop with an idea of what happened and you are touched by curiosity, that's an absolute win for everybody, right? If you manage to uh, bring yourself today into this workshop, that's probably the hardest part, all right? For now, just sit down and yeah, <laughs> just stare at the screen and follow up if you want to. Uh, also, I want to note that I'm from Colombia. English is not my native language. So if I ever make some mistake of if I don't make myself um, understandable, yeah, if I, if I don't make myself uh, easy to understand, then just you can stop me anytime. Just use the little hand here. You can correct me if I said something wrong or if I say something offensive. All right. So without further ado, no more introduction. Let's start. So this is a Google slide that I prepared for this workshop. It's not very long. It's almost like 19 slides. And you will say, oh my God, that's a lot. But you will see that is actually a short amount of slides because uh, most of the time we'll be switching tabs, switching screens, and you will see that in no time, probably like one hour, it will be done, all right? So I will recommend you guys to grab this link and store it somewhere. If you have uh, the time or the chance or an additional screen, you can follow up. I just sent the link in the Google Meets chat. You can open it, you can store it, this is for you. You can save it in your drive or you can download it, do whatever you want with it. This is yours, all right? Perfect. Okay, I see a lot of animals joining here. <laughs> a lot of little thingies here. So, yeah. All right, so the title of this workshop is Let's Build a Twiddle List API with Python and Flask. I know there will be some scary terms along the way, but you will see that I tried to explain everything in super detail, uh, but also being very beginner friendly. So, uh, oh yeah, and also before before we jump to the next slide, this is my LinkedIn. If you want to connect, if you want to write me, if you want to uh, just share a meme with me, you can connect and then write to me. <laughs> also, if you want to ask for, um, if you want to ask for, for advice regarding programming, you, I'm always open to it. So let's close this. All right. So considerations, uh, your LinkedIn. Uh, yes. Lilia. Oh, wait. Oh, I shared the wrong thing. I just repeated the drive link. Sorry. Let me, let me get the LinkedIn for you. There you go. It's in the chat now. Perfect. Uh, hi, Camilo. Is there a GitHub boilerplate for this project? Yes, we will see it in a couple of minutes. Of course, Lilia, you're welcome. All right, so considerations before we start. There is a lot to cover, so we'll go a little bit fast, but you will see that it's not super fast. Uh, so don't get frustrated. Um, 
the worship will be recorded. If you want to go back, it will be on YouTube so you can watch it again. Uh, if you're not going to talk or say, um, I mean, if you're going to participate, please keep your mic mute. And if you're going to do something around, please turn on your, cam your camera up so we don't distract everyone else. Um, yes, here, as I said, if you want to speak, please click on the hands up icon and then I will give you the word and some time to, to speak. Uh, use the chat wisely, please. Uh, if you are going to use it, uh, share things that are useful, no hate, no spam. Sign colored and underlined text is a clickable text. So every, uh, if, if you see this somewhere, just click it and it will take you somewhere magic. Let's close this. Be nice, ask questions and have fun people, all right? I love interaction. I'll be calling you guys. I'll be saying things like, hey, Todd, what do you think about this? Or, or hey, Ben, have you created your account? Or hey, Grace, have you ever heard about Python? All right, if you're not able to interact, that's fine. All right, there's no point with that. But I just just a disclaimer that I will call your name maybe. <laughs> okay, so this is the agenda for today. Before we even start to code, I want to start by uh, explaining some of the main terms, main tools that we are going to use today, like GitHub, Python, Flask, pipemb, and how to use them. All right. So. What we'll do is that we will explain in a very superficial way what is GitHub and why do we use it? What is Python? Why do we use it? Flask, pip, and same fashion. After we understand these main big concepts, then we're going to move on what's an API and how does it work, all right? This is very crucial. This second point is very crucial. It's a little bit theoretical, but I have a very nice example that you will get right away. I assure that. Saying, yes, could you with GitHub? Yes, of course. We'll go deeper in the next slides. Okay, let's continue here. So setting up our project with code spaces and Thunder Client. Uh, this is just some plugins, things that get installed in a couple seconds. So don't worry about this. We will see what this means. What are HTTP methods? This is a little bit technical, but you will see that it's super easy to understand. And I got this in bold because this is the most important step of all of these workshops. It's what, sorry, is how the front end and the back end communicate. All right. So in order to understand this, this fifth step, it's very important that you guys uh, understand the second step. All right. If you guys understand what's going on with second step, then fifth step will be an easy PC one. And finally, we'll do recap and final words. That's it. This is our agenda for today. How you guys see it? Do you like it? Yes. yes? Great. Woo. Okay. Let's continue. Uh, yes. FLT. You want to say something? Yes, Stella. Um, I was just wondering, will we have access to a recording uh, afterwards? Or? Yes, yes, you will. It will be posted on LinkedIn, so you can easily access to it. Okay, from LinkedIn, because I got this through my email. Um, so we go. I, I'll have to like go through your LinkedIn, and it'll be there. No, no. Wait, did I say LinkedIn or YouTube? You said LinkedIn. Okay, my bad. No, no, <laughs> I was confused. It will be posted oh. on YouTube in the Fortigas okay. channel, but don't worry. We will get the okay. link for you. All right, sounds good. Thank you so much. Of course, for sure. Okay, perfect. Okay, so uh, for for Jorge, Jorge, this is your slide, my man. What is GitHub? So GitHub, GitHub is a platform for hosting code, and it's manipulated by Git. All right. If you if you're a a, a little bit more technical savvy and you want to know more about how GitHub works. Then you can click on this link and open it. It's Git. Basically, Git are the commands to control GitHub. All right. So GitHub is just the platform. Git are the actual actions that we do in the in GitHub. A series of commands to upload, update, and delete hosted code. All right. So superficial way, 
easy peasy to understand. GitHub is like a Google Drive for programming projects. All right, that's it. The thing is that, of course, Netflix is not going to store highly confidential and highly valuable code in Google Drive, right? First, because, well, they they are giving their privacy to Google. And second, because it's not a very good way to collaborate because Netflix is not made by one person. It's made by hundreds of engineers. And the way they collaborate is that they use this tool, GitHub, all right? They all, uh, they all add their, their code in this single place that is their GitHub repository. And that's how Netflix is made, okay? So if I open GitHub here, this is the platform. It's not going to show the landing page because I'm already logged in, but uh, let me open it in an incognito one. And then you will see that it has a very nice design. It's very beautiful. But the important stuff is right here, sign up. You click here and you create your GitHub account. All right, now let me tell you something. If you have a GitHub account, that's good. Let's go on. If you don't have a GitHub account, but you want to keep following the, the workshop, then I will say do this step later, right? Because you have to go to your email, confirm, blah, blah, blah. And maybe you can, um, you can get lost. So just open the tab and then you can do that uh, maybe later. So for this project, we must have a GitHub account. That is important. You can create one here, okay? This is only for whoever wants to code along, right? If, you're, if your purpose is just to watch uh, this workshop, then you don't have to do this, this step right now. Okay. Once your GitHub account is created or you already have one, open the project. Let's build a to the list API with Python Flask. So I don't, I don't remember who, but someone said, hey, do we have a boilerplate? Yes, unknown person. We do have a boilerplate for this. So we click here and you see the boilerplate. So, oh my God, Camilo, what is all of that? Remember the Google Drive for, for, for code? This is GitHub, all right? And this is our, let's say, our workplace, all right? We will be working on this. Oh, Camilo, but how? Uh, don't be impatient, I will show you. But what I want to show you here is that these scary names are just common files. If I click here, we will see that it's just text, all right? This is the preview, but if we go to code, we see that it's just text. And this text is converted into this. So we're just uploading files into GitHub. That's, that, that's everything we're doing here. So there's no big mystery around it. Okay. So that's up with the slide with, with GitHub. Everything understood, guys? Yes. Perfect. Now, what is Python? I want to see some emojis, some raise hands if you know Python, if you have heard Python, if you have worked with Python, have you? I see, okay, okay, so, all right, nice. Oh my God, perfect, yes, Stella. Oh, okay, no, no, <laughs> you, you are agreeing, that's fine, perfect. Yes, Python, my people. Okay, so there is a lot of programming languages and programming languages serve the same purpose is telling the computer what to do by a series of steps. That's, that's the main reason and the sole purpose of programming languages, telling the computer what to do. Now, for Python, we have a short and sweet description that is very funny and very technical. But if we read it fast, we will sound like, like a, I don't know, like a genius. Python is a high-level interpreted programming language. Its main features are syntax clarity, dynamic typing, and extensibility. <laughs> yeah, but in but in syntax is sorry in in a summary is that Python is great, guys. It's a robust programming language. It's very flexible. It has a lot of libraries. Libraries are basically stuff that the community makes to make our lives easier. So it's a programming language that is very worth uh, learning that is easy to learn and that is maintained, that, that means that people really care about it and are building stuff with it. And popularity is very important when dealing with a programming language. If you got a programming language that no one uses, then it's a dead programming language. But 
The good thing is that Python is extremely popular. If we check here, uh, they have, if, if someone uh, has heard about Stack Overflow before. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Not as much as people with knowing Python, but Stack Overflow is developer's best friend. It's being replaced by ChatGPT a little bit, but this is still a very important place for the developer community. Why? Can someone tell me why Stack Overflow is very important? Maybe someone knows. Uh, I think I heard that uh, potential employers actually look what you posted on uh, Stack Overflow. If you help our developers uh, to debug uh, the problem and that kind of makes you more marketable. That's true. That's, that's absolutely true. Not all companies do that, but there mm -hmm. are companies that do so. Yes. I, I love the Ben Daniels answer. It's a place where folks go to get coding answers. That's why Stack Overflow is so important <laughs> because you don't know how to do something. You search it in Google and then boom, solution, Stack Overflow. Yes. I don't know if, if you have seen the meme, like what people think I do, and it's like the matrix, what I actually do is copy pasting from a Stack Overflow. <laughs> that's, that's the truth. All right. So a Stack Overflow is super big. Yeah, it's, I love that. Miguel, I love your description. The Bible for all software engineers. That's perfect. So because he's the, well, the sacred text, let's not make it super Christian, but the sacred text of software engineers, then it has a lot of weight into what the tech community thinks and shares. So this is a survey, a survey that a Stack Overflow runs every single year. And these are the results of this year. Now, this has hundreds of thousands of people participating in this survey. So it's very important, all right? And why do I want to share this with you? Because it says here, most popular technologies. And if I scroll down a little bit, we got our friend here, Python, right? And look at this, look at this insane amount of programming languages. And we got Python at a top three. So how cool is that? I mean, if, if, if you're not, if you're not convinced about learning Python, I hope this graph, <laughs> I, I hope this graph really changed your mind. If, if, if I go to learning to code, look at this. Python is about to surpass JavaScript. So if you're a total beginner, you should also pick Python. All right. Okay. Let's close this. Let's go back here. That's Python for us. Let's continue. What's Flask? Oh, what's Flask? So we got GitHub. That is the place where, that, where we are going to store our work. We got Python. It will be our programming language for today. It will be our main tool. And second, what is Flask? So this one is a little bit more technical. All right. So let's read this. Flask is a lightweight WSGI web application framework. It is designed to make getting started quick and easy with the ability to scale up to complex applications. Summary, it is like having a handy toolkit for building web-based projects. All right. So when you are creating a web-based project, you have to deal with a lot of right? You have to deal with ports, you have to deal with uh, responding, you, ha you have to deal with API architecture. But when you use a tool like Flask, they do all of that for us. And with few lines of code, we can make something useful. All right. So when I install Flask in my in my project, and I write this five lines of code, then if I try to access it in my browser, it will return hello world. It will show me something in the screen, right? So I don't have to deal with very complex stuff. I just use Flask, all right? So Flask will be a library that we're going to use today. And Flask is written in Python. So in order to use Flask, we do have to write Python. That's the catch, all right? 
What are the big difference between Flask and Fast API to do an API? Well, so Flask, it's uh, okay. So this is a little bit more technical. Uh, Flask is very lightweight. Flask is not batteries included. The idea for Flask is to uh, um, present something as soon as, sorry, as fast as possible. If you want to um, do something like an ORM, if you want to do complex stuff, you have to install more things or you have to code it your way. All right, and, and it also has a different syntax to create endpoints and routes. Fast API is like Flask. It's also lightweight. It's not opinionated. Uh, one of the big uh, differences is, is that everything you do in Fast API, it gets automatically do do uh, documented. So for Flask, you have to do a little bit more steps to document your endpoints. With Fast API, it is like this. The probably not the good thing is that fast api is fast but it's a little bit more heavy and it also has the problem that you have to install more things in order for it to work but it's a very good alternative flask is very nice because in all the libraries and frameworks around um, creating an api with python this is the most easy one so yeah it's a very nice where uh, spot to start uh, what's better, Flask or Django? It depends on what you want to create. Uh, Flask is more uh, is more suited for um, simple applications where, where again, where you want where you want to display something, where you want to make it work fast. Django is um, batteries included. It's opinionated. It has a way to work. You you don't you can't really um, you you can really customize it as much as Flask. So if you have a robust application that basically can't fail <laughs> and you have a very stable technologies, Django can be an option. Okay, so let's move on. This is pipamp. I will go super fast with this one. Basically pipamp is uh, a command that we will use to install our, our libraries. So if we want to install Flask, we will have to use pipamp, all right? That's everything we gotta know about this one. Oh yeah. I like this one. Pip M is like your help of kitchen organizer for Python projects. Basically, when, when we tell Pip M, hey, Pip M, please install Flask, it will make a room in our project so we can easily access Flask. All right. That's everything we have to know about this one. Okay, guys. So we have seen GitHub. This is where we're going to store our, our code. Python, programming language. Flask, main tool we're going to use to build the API. PipMP, this is the other tool that will get us Flask installed. So how are you feeling so far? It's OK. We are ready for the action. <laughs> <laughs> nice. All right. Sorry sorry to burst your bubble, but we, of course, we'll have action. But this is like the last slide um, about theory. So guys. Remember that I said that if you understand, sorry, yes, if you understand step two, you will understand step five. So this is step two, guys. So please pay attention to this one. What is an API and how does it work? In my personal opinion, this is the most important slide. <laughs> why? Because this is the whole deal with APIs. This is why we create APIs. This is why we use them. This is why they are important, all right? So let's read this. API receives a request, similar to how a waiter takes an order from a customer to relay to the chat. All right. So we are going to code a waiter. Of course, well, we're not going to do it in a literal way, but <laughs> we are going to code like a waiter that takes up requests, send it to the chat, and then the and then gets gets the meal and sends it to the customer, right? So think about a restaurant. A customer comes to a restaurant, asks for the waiter, and says, "Hey, I want I don't know, I want a Caesar salad." Then the waiter gets that request from the customer and will go to the kitchen, all right? And then and then the chef in the kitchen is going to receive that request. Hey, wait, sorry. Hey, chef, we need a, a Caesar salad. Chef will get to work, finishes the salad. The waiter gets the salad and then delivers it to the customer. That's how an API works. 
it's like a waiter in a restaurant. You get some requests from customers, send this to the kitchen, and once the kitchen is done, then it gets the plate to the customer. All right? Guys, do you understand this? Yes, it's a good example to understand the, the idea. Mm -hmm. So this is the most important stuff. So when someone tries to be smart on you and say, ah, oh, you don't even know what an API is, you can pull off this, this example. Of course I know what is an API. Camilo told me. Uh, who's Camilo? No, no. You, you, you can say an API is like a waiter, right? Its main purpose is to, is to um, communicate the kitchen with the customer. That's everything you got to know about what's an API. Okay, we got a question here from Jorge. Before APIs, what was used to do the same? Huh, this is a very good question. Um, before APIs, no, APIs, let's, let's uh, think that APIs always existed. Probably what, what didn't exist before was the customer because uh, front-end revolution, <laughs> I call it like that, is very recent. Uh, the idea of um, uh, uh, yeah, the idea of a front end asking for things to the back end is fairly new. Before back end did everything. So if you go, I don't know how it's in your countries, but in my country in Colombia, when you go to the government pages, they suck. They are very very slow and very bad because uh, how it works is that the back end. Um, delivers everything, even, even the graphical interface. So it's like they create their own customer, but they are still like in the kitchen. It's weird to understand, but yeah. So before APIs, we just had like extremely simple and ugly inputs to request things to the, to the, um, to the database. So APIs always existed. Maybe what didn't exist was customers before. That's the way I see it. Okay, let's continue. Okay, action. I don't know who was asking for action, but now it's time for action. Let's get to work. Start here. So let's click here, boom. And we will get again into our repository. So how do we start the action? All right, so what you will usually do if you are going to work on this locally is that you have to clone it. And by clone, it will be that you have to follow some more steps, like uh, getting this link, installing Git in your machine, downloading it, a lot more things. But what we are not going to use that. We are going to do everything on the browser. So you don't have to install anything. This is very cool because we can start right away. So how do we start right away? If you have your GitHub account, just click here. And you go to this section that says code spaces. All right. Once you are here, you have a button that says create code space on master. So let's click here. What this means is that GitHub will open the project for you and will have everything configured so you can get to work. That's it. So you can get to code. So you don't have to think about installing stuff. You don't have to think about a lot of other concerns. You just open the code spaces and that's it it will take a, a few seconds to finish uh, setting everything up for you so let's wait a little bit <sighs> delicious and let's close oh no this is okay let me just close some unused tabs here on the uh, Google Slides, you can see it here. Setting GitHub code spaces, create code spaces on master. All right. If you uh, read the slides before, sorry, after the workshop, you can get here. Okay, it is done. How do you know it is done? Because everything is stopped loading and stopped moving. Oh, wait, no, it's not done. It's still moving. Let's wait a little bit. Perfect. It's moving here. All oh, right, now we're done. Okay, uh, instead of Visual Studio, why not PyCharm? It's your decision, really. We are going to use code spaces today because that requires no installation in your computer. But everyone has the same machine. There are people that are on the phone. 
And yeah, it's just to save time and headaches. So we use code spaces today. All right. So when everything stops, <laughs> that's your green light to know that it finished setting up. All right. So let's let's try to digest this screen right here. So this screen right here has uh, four main components. On the left, we got the files, right? So when I click on a file, it will open and it will show us its contents, all right? Here, uh, uh, what is, yeah, down, down here, we got something called the terminal. This is where we're going to issue some commands, but it's easy, it's copy paste. So you don't have to worry about this thing. It will just show us like uh, output of whatever we do here in our code. Third screen here is something called learn pack. So what is learn pack? Learn pack is basically a tool that we use to um, code the solution step by step. So this is also very cool stuff because here we will do every single thing step by step. It's not like I'm teaching you the solution, that's it. No, if you ever do this on your own, you will have learn pack here. It's like your online teacher because you can read here the instructions and then you can click here next and it will get you to the next thing that you have to do. It's very simple. Okay, let's go back to previews. And here, this is our last screen. This is where we edit our code. So we will see that, let's say, learn.json, it has a lot of things. So we can write here, this is where we're going to edit. All right. You're using Copilot? No, no, I, no, I'm not. All right, so here you can write stuff. Maybe sometimes, because this can get buggy, sometimes your, your screen opens like this without the learn pack. All right, so what do we do in that moment? Let's click on the slide. It says, if learn pack is not running automatically or crashes, let's just do learn pack start in the terminal, All right? So we do something like this. If learn pack doesn't open for you, you just do learn pack start, boom. And then it will rerun for you and it will open. Okay. Look, it didn't open for me. So we do this until it opens because, okay, now it opened. Sometimes it gets a little bit buggy. It has happened to me before and, and my students. So I figured out this is the best, <laughs> this is the best approach. Learnback keeps crashing. Yes, I know, I know. You have to be patient with it. Okay, cool. So that's everything we need. Let's close this and let's start. It says here, welcome to Flask. In this tutorial, we're going to be building a REST API. I'll explain this later. That exposes three endpoints, all right? But where the instructions come? What do you mean to uh, start learn pack? You can see it on the slide here. If you mean the instructions to complete the project, it's on learn pack itself. Okay, so we're going to code three endpoints, all right? We're going to do a very nice example. I'll give you a spoiler like this. It's a very visual example about, about a boat that goes around a city and a harbor, all right? And this will help us understand what's going on. But that's a spoiler, right? wait for it. Okay, so yes, we're going to code three endpoints, the get to-dos that will get us some to-dos, right? The idea is to create like a, a small to-do list and we will have three actions. The first one is to retrieve the to-dos, the second one is to create a new to-do. And, and the third one will be to delete a to-do. All right? Perfect. So let's continue. Once we read these steps, we just click on Next right here. Let me close this. Perfect. OK, so it says here. Hello world with Flask. During this tutorial, we're going to build a REST API using Python programming language in Flask 
library. But we're going to do it the right way, following all the good practices. We have to install and learn something first. Requirements, Python 3 plus and PIP AMP, all right? Instructions, we, we gotta make sure that our Python version is right. So let's open our terminal. That is not opening for me. Okay, there you go. If you're on a Mac, it's Command J. If you're on Windows, it's Control J. So let's go here to create a new terminal because maybe you ask, hey, how can I type stuff if this is like occupied? Then you just click, then you just click here on the plus icon. Boom. And then it will get us a new terminal. Let's do it again. Boom. It will get us a new terminal. So it says here, make sure you have Python 3 by running the following commands, right? So we copy here and we paste here. See, it's simple. You just copy and paste. It says Python 3.10. So we're good. We are very good here. Then it says, instead of using pip and virtualenv separately, we're going to use pipenv. Now, they're asking us to check if we got pipenv installed. Let's do it. There you go. We got Python and we got pipenv. So we're good to go. If this is, if this is correct, then we we'll have to click on next. Let's click here. Okay, initialize pipenv. It is possible to have several Python projects with different versions of Python. This is why you need to specify which Python version you want to use. In this case, we're going to use this one, the three, all right? So let's do that. Let's make sure that we are on Python version three. So we copy this command, we paste it here, and then we run it. It will do some magic for us here. It will install it, make sure that this is the Python version we need. And once it is done, it will give you this output and then it will reshare us the terminal. Perfect. It says here, you should see a pip file on the, on the root of your project and it should have the requires inside of Python uh, 3 plus version. So if we go left, we see a pip file, just as the instruction says. And there you go, requires the Python version, okay? So this file makes sure that the Python version for this project is 3.10, okay? So let's go back here, everything is fine. And I want to ask you guys, how you feel? Okay, okay. Is it too difficult? Am I going too fast? Or is it good? No, okay, nice. Perfect. So we just installed Python 3, and now our project knows that this is the Python version that we need. Let's click here. Install Flask. Finally, we are installing. Remember that I said that pipenv is the, is the tool that will help us to install Flask? Now, this is the step where we do that. It says, now we have to install our first package dependency, Flask. So you have Python 3.7 versus the one you have at 3.10. All right, so the important stuff is the first number. If it's three, it doesn't matter what numbers come after the dot, all right? The important stuff is that your Python is at least three dot whatever, but three is fine for this project. Now run instructions. It says here, let's run this. So what this is going to do, and I think you already deducted it, is that it will install Flask for us. All right, so let's do this. Oh, yes, I just pressed enter. It will install everything and boom. It says here, adding Flask to pip files packages. So, let, so let's go here and look, it just added a new line. It says packages Flask. This means that Flask has been installed successfully in our project. Let's go back here. It is showing us what's the expected output. And now we are ready because Python is installed, pipm is installed, Flask is installed. All right, now take a look at this very interesting. When I try to click on next, it says, that's your exercise solution before you can continue to the next step. This means that we have to click on here, this little test icon. For some instructions, it, it won't appear, but for 
but for, sorry, steps. But for some steps, it will require to. So let's click here. It is testing our code and it says everything as is expected for now. <laughs> no, no, everything expected. Let's click on next. So then you will be able to click next. That's fine. All right, let's read this. First, Flask application. First, uh, sorry, Flask is an app that behaves like a web server. It exposes a group of URLs to the internet. For example, you can use Flask with a domain and expose the following URLs to the internet. Mywebsite.com, home, about me, and contact me. All right? So I will, I will be saying a lot of uh, this word. It's called endpoint. All right? So an endpoint is like one bit of the URL. That's everything. I mean, it will make sense when, uh, if we go further. But try to think that an endpoint is a piece of the URL. That's everything you got to know for this one. Those three URLs are exposed by Flask and will become your personal website. That's correct. To create our first server, we need to add the following two lines to our Python file that we are going to create. These two lines have to be in every Flask project you create to work correct. All right. So we got to write this. But where? So let's read the instructions. It says here, on the root of your project, create a source folder. Right? When it says the root of your project, it's this place, OK? You are not going to create anything in this folder or in this one, or in fact, in any of these folders. You are going to create it at the same level as them. So to create a new folder, you click on this little folder icon right here, and it says that it should be called SRC. This is short for source. So when I do this, I got my folder created. But this is empty, and empty is no fun. So it says here inside of it, create a file named app.py. So to create a file, we just click here on the paper sheet uh, icon, and then let's call it app.py. And this is how our journey begins. So this is the inside of the file. It's empty. It, <laughs> it has anything, but we need to put something there. OK, I just dragged the file here on the left so we can have the instructions on the right, files on the left. It says here, as instructed above, add the code to create a new Flask app. So let's get this. Let's paste it here. And to save, we just do Command S uh, in Mac. In Windows, will be Control S. OK, so I follow the instructions. I got the little check icon here. So I got to click on it to see if it works. And it says here, everything as expected, congrats. So this means that we are now in our way to create our API. First, by initializing Flask. So let's click here and next, let's continue. Running your new application. After creating our app, we need to run and start the application. All right? when the application runs, it will take over your command line or your terminal. I will not be able to type anything, but that's fine. That's why we can create several terminals because we can have one occupied and we can use the rest to keep running commands. So instructions, add the following lines at the bottom of your app.py file. Remember, this should be in your source folder. OK, it is in the source folder. So let's copy this and let's paste it here. Let's save. It says here, these two lines should always be at the very end of your file. To run your new server, open a new separate terminal and enter the following command, pip amp run python source app.py. So this is like our trigger. This is the way we turn on our server. If we check here on the, on the GIF, we see that when, when this person uh, writes down the command and enters, it will turn on our Flask server. So let's do that for ourselves. Let's paste it. Let's click on Enter. And look at this. Let me close this. It says here, running on HTTP, some numbers, and 3245. This means that our API, our server, is now live. All right? So when I click here, when I do Command click, Windows Control click, it will open a new tab for me. OK, perfect. So it says 404 not found. And that's 
and that is correct. I mean, there is no issue with that. But the good thing is that it is at least giving us this error. This means that the server is live, that the API is being created, but we haven't added anything to it yet. So why will it find anything? Because there is nothing <laughs> to search. Okay, perfect. So we are in our path. Oh, and look at this. This is something interesting. When I got into the tab, it says that we tried to get something from it, but, but, but because there is anything to fetch, it would just give us a 404. There is the 404 not found. If I refresh here, you will see in the logs that it tried to get something there again, right? So this is a living thing, guys. <laughs> Our API is now alive. Perfect. So let's click on check. Everything is okay. And we should continue. So let's click on here. All right, check for live URL. This is what we did. Once you open it successfully, your live API should say not found. The reason the API says not found right now is because we have not added any endpoints so far, meaning there is no da data being fetched or sent. All right, so I think this part is clear. The API is live, but there's nothing there. So it will give us a 404. Okay, because this part is not is 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 checked 404, and we can go with next. All right, perfect. So we are going to start. We are going to really start coding the endpoints of our API. It says here, creating a first endpoint. Since Flask is a server, it only makes sense to add some URLs to expose over the internet. For example, mydomain.com hello. All right, as a developer, if we, if we would like people to visit our, our web page and show a message like hello world to those people, we have to add the following endpoint is our, our app.py file. So let's grab all of this code and let's paste it. Let's paste it here, all right? So basically, this reads the following. When I visit my route, I'm gonna get a greeting. A hello world, right? And we will see that happening in just a couple of seconds. So here it's basically telling us that when reaching this route right here, we are going to get a hello world. That's everything it is saying there. All right, so let's look at the instructions. Using that knowledge, make sure your server returns a string like this. So let's grab the string and let's paste it here because that's what they are requesting. When the URL to do is typed on the browser, all right? So I want to ask people, if I want this to be shown in our screen, all right? When we do to do's, I mean, when we in the URL write to do's, then I'll have to change something in this line. What do you guys think it should change? I need to... Edit something. Come on, guys. I know you can. Okay, so if I go to the route, let's say, let me, yeah. Okay, so this is saved. If I go here and I don't specify a route, yes, Saif, you got it, man. That's That's the answer. If I go here and I write, let's say, no, uh, doesn't exist, of course, it will keep showing us a 404. But if I do my route right here and I do it here on the URL, it will show us something. Hello. Oh, how cool is that? All right, and th then let's go back. But the thing is that they are telling us to change my route to to lose. So everything we gotta do is that we gotta change this to to lose and save. So what's going to happen now if I refresh the web page? Take a look at the URL. If I refresh the web page, what's going to happen, guys? 404. Why is it gonna give me a 404 ban? Or anyone? Correct, the URL ending change. So if I do refresh, 
not found. Then if I want to get hello again, I have to do to lose, right? Because that's the URL I got into my code. Perfect. Okay, guys, I see that you're understanding. I love that. Okay, so I think that's everything for the instructions. Let's click on the check and everything is as expected. Perfect, 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 perfect. So let's click on next. Demo your API. This is what we just did. We just open the tab, we check that everything is fine, and we are getting the hello world. If we see the GIF, we see that that's the behavior we got right now. So that's awesome. Let's click on next. Returning a JSON. All right. Now, this is the fun part. Let's read this one. REST APIs have to return data in JSON format. And we will get to the, to, to the uh, both examples right here pretty soon. Don't worry. So, oh, oh, OK, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> OK, so it says here, REST APIs have to return data in JSON format, all right? You can use Flask JSONify. Uh, it's a function to easily convert any of the basic data to JSON. All right, guys. So JSON, what's JSON? No, it's it, it's not a man, it's not a name. JSON is the universal language for APIs. All right, and what I mean by this is that it doesn't matter what is your front end. It doesn't matter what is your back end. If you guys can communicate in JSON, that's everything you need, all right? So if, if for the front end we're using, I don't know, React, Vue, Svelte, right, Amber, if we're Angular, it doesn't matter. If you request things in JSON, right, then our backend can understand. And the same for the other way around. If the backend responds in JSON, it doesn't matter if it's made with Flask, if it's made with .NET, if it's made with Node, if it's made with, um, with, with Haskell, it doesn't matter if it's JSON, all right? So let's go some steps back and let's think about the restaurant example, all right? So let's pretend that um, I'm a Colombian, right? My main language is Spanish, okay? But I go to, uh, I go to, um, yeah, I go to a Chinese re uh, restaurant. No one, I mean, in the kitchen, they do not speak Spanish, right? So how can I order things? But the waiter, our API, does speak English, right? So what happens? I tell the waiter, hey, look, I want, um, I don't know, I want a chow mein and then the waiter will, will, will get that request, will understand because the waiter understands English. We go to the kitchen and we'll tell the chef. My main language is Paisa. <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> probably, uh, probably because of the accent. <laughs> but yeah, uh, you figured, you figured. So I, I think I might have a, a thick pa Paisa accent. All right, but uh, coming back to the example, I think you guys now get it. JSON is like English in the world, all right? It doesn't matter from uh, where you are. Yeah, no, it doesn't matter where you're from or where you are. If you can speak English, well, most of the times, if you can speak English, people will understand you. And this is the reality for front end and back end. If you deal with JSON, you it doesn't matter what technology you're using. I want to ask you guys, do, do you understand this? What's JSON? Yes, nice. Okay, let's continue. Okay, so here it's telling us that uh, we should use something called uh, Flask JSONify. So JSONify is like a translator, all right? It will take our data and it will transform it into JSON. That means that the waiter will, will, will get the Chinese answer and will translate it into Spanish, for, uh, English for us, all right? That's JSONify. It's a translator. That's it. So if we check here, what it does is that it is that it imports it, and then it gets some data, and it converts it into JSON. After that, we return. All right. 
So let's grab all of this. Let, let's grab all of this. And let's, oh my God, uh, and let's paste it. So let's do this. I believe this is to do's. Perfect. Some data like this. And we are missing the import. So let's do this. And let's do a command, sorry, not a command, a comment. Because why not? It's, it's, it's good for you, your understanding. All right, so what's going on here, guys? It's a three easy step. Does data need to be dictionary for JSON? Uh, yes. Yes and no. But let's say yes for a short answer, yes. OK, so here. It says, very plain English, from Flask import Flask, our library, and JSONify, our translate, all right? So we know that in the to-dos route, right, in our to-dos endpoint, we are going to deliver something, all right? So if I keep doing um, this is a response and I save it, Sorry guys, sometimes, wait, something happened here. It, ta -ta. Let me see if our, if our flask is still running. No, okay. Sometimes when you do drastic changes in your code, flask can crash, but, it, but don't worry. If it crashes, you just kill it. That means you close the terminal or you delete it and then you run this command again. So let's run it again. It will, it, it will turn on Flask again for us. So because I am returning, this is a response. When I go to this URL, it's going to give me, this is a response, exactly as we see it here. That's cool. Now, I don't want to return this is a response, right? I want to return real data. So here we got a to-do. Well, not a to-do, but it's like uh, some data. It says name Bobby, last name Rixer. So if we want to uh, return this, we, we got we, we to gotta JSONify, right? We got to translate it. So we do this here. JSONify, I open my parentheses, and I send whatever I want to uh, translate. So if I delete this, it will be used like this. I open my parentheses. I do some data. And then JSON text will be the translated version of what I have here, OK? So this is our Chinese, and this is our English. JSON text is the translated stuff. So when I responded here, we will see how it looks. Let's refresh here, and we will see here this, all right? Hey, Camilo, what, what happens if I don't, if I don't do it? If I forget about the JSONify, let's take a look. Let's see what happens. So I want to return this without translating, without JSONifying. And because browsers are very modern today, it will work, right? And it will show us this. But this doesn't mean that this is the correct way to do things, all right? Before, it will break. It won't work. but. <laughs> Thankfully, browsers are more advanced, and they say, oh, look at this dumb developer. <laughs> it didn't uh, translate it to JSON. OK, I will do it for you. But don't get too comfy, because for large requests, you do need to JSONify it. So because we are good developers, we are JSONifying it, we are translating. And when we refresh, we can see things here. All right? So guys, let me ask you, is this clear? Is it clear why why is this being shown on the screen? Nice, beautiful. I love it. OK, so if we apply this knowledge to our to-do list project, we can create a global variable named to-dos that we hold the list of to-dos like this. All right, so because today this is not a workshop about databases, we are going to do everything local. That means that we are going to create local data like this. In the real world, this stuff is stored in a database, right? And what the API does is that the API searches in the database, all right? Or at least requests for search in the database. The database is the kitchen people, right? We are just coding the waiter. Remember that. 
Okay. So to do this is our list. Perfect. So I want to ask you something, guys. If I do this, is it is it correct or incorrect? No. Okay. They say no, but why? Why no? You need to JSONify. Correct. Correct. Okay, so let's do it. Let's create a perfect Miguel. Perfect guys. So let's do it, JSON to those. And this will be equals to the JSONify function. And we pass the tools. So now we are sending a JSON response. This is the correct way to go. As I said, it crashed, but then I can run it again and everything as normal. So now when I refresh, I will get my list of to do's as we see here. Okay. So we finally got to this point, people. We got to the point of the example. But before doing this, we are going to install our friend Thunder Client. In fact, I think this should go up here. Okay. Our friend Thunder Client. So what's Thunder Client? For, for, for our get, that means for retrieving the to-dos, this screen is fine. But then we will have to deal with uh, creating to-dos. And we will need a little bit uh, of a more advanced tool. So what we can do is that we can install Thunder Client. Thunder Client is a plugin that will help us to request things to our API. So if we go back here and we click in the extensions, that is this little icon right here, same thing as Postman, you are correct, Leo. Same stuff. And I search for Thunder Client and we click on install, then it will be installed in a couple of seconds. I promise this. Remember that I said that you will get things installed in a couple of seconds? Like this. So it is installed. Once it is installed, you will see a new icon here on the left, a little thunder icon. You click on there and it will load us a prompt here. Oh, sorry. Yes. And we click on new request. All right, let's close this. And here is very important because here is where we can make our beautiful requests for our API. So let's grab this URL and let's paste it here. Nice. All right. And this is a get. Why is it a get? And I'll explain that in a couple of seconds because it says here methods get. So when I do a get to this U to this endpoint, sorry, I should get. <laughs> see, I should get this. Okay, I should get this to do. So if I go to the new request, I put the URL with the endpoint, and it's a get, and I click on send, then it won't work because I am hitting this. No, no, no. This is not the URL you want, sorry, because this is uh, HTTPS. We need this one because we are testing locally. Sorry, guys, this one. This one is the one you want, all right? You can get it from here, down here. So you click on send and boom, people. Look at this. Let me make some space. Nice. Look at this, guys. We are getting our response, all right? So it's cool forget, but when we go to post that is creating stuff, then we will need Thunder, okay? So guys, is the Thunder installation and usage clear? Beautiful, beautiful. Okay, nice, nice. All right, so that's what up for installation. Let's go for, okay, let's go this. I will make a, a quick stop here. Uh, it's about what are the HTTP methods, all right? So I've been saying get, get, post. What are those? Those are the actions that we can make in an API, all right? So get is for reading content. That means retrieving content from a database. Post 
is to create content. That means to add content to a database. Put is to update, all right? Is to update content of a database. And delete, you guessed it, is to delete content in a database. These are the four main actions, the four main methods that we can use in an API. So far, we have coded a get. That means get me some information, but now we're going to create a post. That means create some information, add some information, all right? So if this is confusing for you, I will finally explain it in this, in this little visual example. Okay, guys, so let's pretend that our front-end client is a city, all right? And our back-end server is like a harbor, all right? So the harbor has two things. It has the endpoints, that is this, this thing that we see right here. It has a worker, that, that is the API, uh -huh. and it has a warehouse, all right? This is where everything is stored. So let's so so let's think that the city requests the boat hey boat uh go go to the harbor and retrieve um what what do you guys want us to retrieve hmm ah huh. what about cookies what chocolate 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 all right let's do chocolate <laughs> so city so the city has a sweet tooth it says hey we need chocolate we love chocolate. So that's a request, right? The, the request is we need chocolate. Let, let me have some chocolate. And then the boat goes here to this harbor, sorry, to this endpoint, to this port, and they are going to request for that chocolate. So the boat, the captain of the boat tells the worker, hey, worker, I come from the city. The city is requesting chocolate. Could you search some chocolate for me in the warehouse? The worker says, of course, my friend. It will get to the warehouse. It will get the chocolate. It will go back. Oh, it will, it will go back with the chocolate and it will tell, and it will load it to the boat, right? Now the boat has the chocolate and it will go back to the city. Hey, I got your chocolate, all right? So this is the full flow. This is the full flow. And we are coding this work right here. So we just did it for, for to-dos. So the front end says, hey, get me the to-dos, right? Then the boat, the captain of the boat tells the worker to uh, please go search in the warehouse uh, the to-dos. Now the worker has the to-dos and it loads them into the boat. So now the boat has the to-dos, and when it goes back to the to the front end client, it now has the to-dos. Oh. How's this example for you guys? Understood? Yes, it's clear. Perfect. Uh, we will remember the example. So when we have problems, we will remember this and it helps. Woo, nice, I love it. That's, that's the whole purpose. All right, cool, let's continue then. So we just did this, all right? Okay, perfect. So we got everything done. Let's click on test to see if it works. It, ga it gave us a green light, nice. So let's click on next. Clear like a beer. Oh man, you know, my favorite kind of beer is the Groot beer. It's the original recipe for a beer. And it's very clear. It's like amber-like, but it's not a pale, not a blonde, not a Pils beer. It's it's a weird beer, but it's delicious. I recommend it, Groot beer. Let me write it here. If you drink, huh? if you don't drink, keep drinking water. <laughs> okay, so uh now check the api this is what we did just now so we are going to click on check here can you copy here the code of the app.py uh yeah sure but uh let's see if it lets me 
paste everything. Oh man, la modelo negra is nice. But you know what? I like the Bohemia even more. I know it's more commercial, but I love Bohemia. I don't know why. Okay, so I think I can't I can't give you uh I can't paste it. Uh because Google Chat has a limit of characters. So yeah. Remember, you can follow along in YouTube. All right, so that's done. Let's click on next. Okay. Uh, so here, we just got this done, the get. Now let's do a post. Guys, what is the post for? Can someone tell me what is the post for? Send data, sending some data. Oh my God, these guys are on fire. I love it. Okay, so in order to build a post to those endpoints, we have to do something similar, all right, to the get method. Perfect. All right. So here they are basically uh, teaching us what's the structure of this, but I won't go into detail. Maybe uh, you get more confused. <laughs> so the important stuff is that, okay, we, we need to import a request here. So let's import request. Why? And we will see that in a minute. We will see that in a minute. So let's uh, import this. And in instructions, it says import request. That's what we have here. And then let's create a new endpoint such as this. So let's copy all of this. OK, cool. And we got this here. All right, so what's going on here, people? Let's, let's read this. So there is something interesting is that we are using the same URL. And for some of you, you will say, hey, Camilo, but isn't that an error? Because if we're using the same uh, URL, the same endpoint, then how will the program know which, which uh, code to trigger, right? The difference is here in the method. So get is for getting the to-dos post. Look, it has a different kind of logic, okay? So if we take a look at this, we see that the request data is stored in a request body. And then we print it right here, okay? So it's easier when we make uh, an example, okay? So let's create a new request here and let's grab the same URL, let's paste it here, but it has a different, well, it has something different. It's not get anymore, it's post, right? So when I do this, our endpoint, the to-do's endpoint, is gonna behave in a whole different manner, all right? So when I do this, like um, when I do the, the, what's the shape of the, okay, like this, done and label. So when I do a parameter like done, and I want to say that this new, uh, task for the to-do list, it's not done, it's false. And then the label for it, okay, guys, give me some ideas here. What, what new task should we add here? While I drink some water, <laughs> write, write your ideas. I will pick the best one. Just name a task, like, I don't know cook dinner, something like that. Clean the house, nice. All right, let's do that. So clean the house. Now I need to ask you, Ben, is your house clean or not? That will help us pretty damn clean, bro. Oh man, so instead of true, it'll be super true. No, 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 I'm kidding. True. <laughs> True is okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. I was doing this in in the wrong um, in, in the wrong tab. My bad. Because I see that when I type here, it gets edited here, but no, no. <laughs> this is not the place where you want to do this. It's here. Sorry. We so we do a JSON-like object like this, 
But we do exactly the same. We do done and then we say true, right? Because because uh, Ben's house is pretty damn clean. So now we do label and the label will be clean. Oh, sorry. It will be clean the house. Perfect. And we can get rid of this. Okay, perfect. It's here on body, right? Body, you see that it says JSON and we got to write it in the JSON structure. So this will be very interesting because when I click on send, it will say, sorry, it will say response for the post to do. And that is actually correct because that's what we are responding right here. But the important stuff is here. We need to print, all right? This endpoint prints whatever we send. So if we check the terminal, look at this, my, my people. Incoming request with the following body, done through label clean house. All right, so each time I request here, look, it responds with whatever we send here. So this is how we create stuff in our database, okay? And this is being printed because of this, because of this print line, right? I think this part is clear. How you guys feel about this? Is it clear? Perfect. Love it, guys. Love, love your interactions. All right, so click on test. Everything is, is as expected. Yes? Okay, no. Perfect. Nice. Let's let's move on. Hello, Dipti, you want to say something? Okay. So test your endpoint. This is what we just did. So we know what's going on here. We go down here, use Postman in order to API, blah, blah, blah. This is the request that we are trying to send. Of course, we have a better one, like clean the, cleaning the house. So everything should go as, as expected. Nice. So let's continue. Boom. Finish the post to do. Your code should look like this now. OK, we got it. Now, if we want to finish our post method, we have to perform the following specific actions. First, make sure that you are converting the request body into a real Python data structure, like a dictionary. You can see that we already used request of JSON. For that, since we know the request will be an application of JSON. Oh, okay, we missed that. So it's not request data anymore, it's request.json. All right, and let's hit it again. It should work like a charm. So look at the difference. This is giving us like a weird stuff with the back slash and n with p, but once we do it with JSON, look, it's cleaner. All right, it's converted now. Perfect. Okay, nice. Okay, so now we are just printing. We are just printing our request, right? We need to go a step further. We need to store it, right? So right now we got just two to-dos, but it will be cool for us to keep adding to-dos into this array, into this list, right? And that's what we are going to do. So if we read it at the instructions, it says add the contents of the decoded request body into the to-dos list, all right? Return the updated to-dos to the front end. Do not forget to JSONify your return. Why is it necessary? Well, we already know why. So what do we have to do here? Easy peasy. Now, because we got, oh wait, sorry. <laughs> it's not here, it's here. So we got now our request body. So let's be more clear, request uh, body JSON. It's now in JSON form, that's fine. So the next step is to add it to this array right here, to this list. Right now we got just two items, this and this. But then how, how can we add it to this list? We do todos and we will use a function called append. If it shows me something, but it's not, so no problem. We just use append. What append is going to do is that I will add it into this list. 
So let's grab the request body.json. Let's paste it there. And then we will do something like uh, JSON to do's. We will we, we, we'll copy and paste this. And at last, we will return the to do's list. OK, so what's going on here? Step one, we get the request and convert it into a JSON, a JSON-like object, like a dictionary in Python. Then what? Then we store it in our to-dos list. Then what? We convert the to-dos list into a JSON. And last but not least, we return it. Are these steps clear, guys? Yes. Nice. Perfect. So when I go back here, it is not going to log anything anymore, but it should respond us with the new set of to-dos. So let's do it. I click on send. Oh, wait. The API is down. It crashed. So let me click here. OK, nice. Now that is up again, let's click on send. And look at this. We got the two tasks that we already have, one and two. And then we got clean the house. Nice, right? What about our last thing, uh, eat chocolate? So if I click on send, boom, we got now clean the house and eat chocolate. Now we are storing stuff in our database. Well, database in quotes because it is stored locally. <laughs> but yeah, now we're working. So if, if I go back to this slide, now you get it. Now this is different. Okay, this is a this is a different example. Now the city says, look, I have a cargo. Okay. Boat, you gotta take it to the warehouse. You gotta store it there. Okay. So what is our cargo? Is this request that says sample two, done true. All right? This is our new task. So the boat will go, will travel the seas and will get to the harbor, but it won't go to this port anymore because this port doesn't accept adding stuff in the warehouse, right? It just, this port is just to retrieve stuff. So when we go to this one, when we go to the post, then it will work. Now the captain of the boat will say, yes, sure. So then the captain of the, of the, um, of the boat will say, hey, look, I got a request from the city. It says that you got to store this in the warehouse. The worker will get the request, will get the cargo, and then it will store it in the warehouse. There you go. Perfect, right? So if I refresh this, we'll see that it's being added little by little. We get more and more stuff here. So this is what happened, right? Also, uh, we are being um, respond, uh, responded a, a copy of whatever is in the warehouse, right? So the boat will get that and we'll go back to the city. I will say, look, now the content of, of the warehouse is like this. It's two tasks, not one anymore. Okay, so let's go back here so the slide can be as it was initially. Nice. Okay, guys, is this example clear? What we did for post? Yes, nice, perfect, sweet. All right, let's continue then. Oh no, okay, nice. So that's done, let's click on test. Everything is, is as expected. And uh, let's click here. Guys, we are about to finish the workshop. So wake up if you're sleeping. <laughs> no, no, I'm kidding. But we're about to finish the workshop. You will be free from me, no problem. <laughs> but yeah, we, we, are, we are going to uh, talk about what, what is delete, OK? So remember that we got the actions, get, post, put, and delete. We are going to do put today. We are going to do delete, OK? So delete, simple. We're going to remove something from the warehouse. Let's read it here. Deleting a to-do is basically the opposite of adding a new one. 
So you should be, so you, you should use 90% of the code from the post to do's. And I think that's right. Okay. So the, so let's read this. The main difference is that delete to do uh, position end, we will receive a position to delete the URL of the request like this, right? So it will have a position that we can get from here. And this is an interesting part that we will, that we will know that we will see how it works pretty soon. And then it will say that it will delete something at certain position. We use the greater, uh, the less than and greater than symbols. Flask will, will return whatever the client specified on that part of the URL as a variable. So it, it looks confusing, but it's actually pretty simple. What, what do you mean, Jorge? Please, could you send me the link of the recording? I have to go. Oh, yes, for sure, for, for sure, or not. What do you mean, Jorge? The process you have seen. I don't get it, sorry. No, I think he just wants the link to GitHub. Like, that's how I understood it. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Uh, yes, yes, but. I don't I don't think I will I will save this. No? Okay. Well, whatever it is, you you can write it in the in the chat. I can take a look at it. Okay, so okay, so we're going to do delete. Okay? Simple. For example, this is for, okay, look at this. So if I do to do's and then the, the next item after the slash is a number like one. It will call the function delete to do, and it will delete whatever item we got in position one. Okay. Uh, Jorge, how can you, can you repeat the process? I recommend you watch this recording because there are a couple of steps involved in it and we can go back. Okay, so instructions, add this endpoint to your app file. Okay, let's do it. So let's grab this and let's paste it here. All right. Sure, sure, Jorge. So uh, you will need to go you have repo and clone the repo to your uh, machine. No, not really, not really. Remember that we're using code spaces. You don't have to install anything. But if you want to do it, that's cool because you will have it in your computer. Okay, nice. So this is our new route, okay? What's the weird thing here? Oh, well, not weird, but what's the new thing is that now we are accepting a number. All right, we're accepting a position here. So let's, as always, let's do new request. Let's grab the URL like this. Let's paste it here. Let's, this is a delete now. Now we have get, post, delete. And here we can specify a position. Let's say that I want to delete the first one, right? So I will do one or I will do if I want to delete the second one, then, then I will do two, right? Nice. So what happens when I click on send? It will return something. This is correct because this is what we are returning here, something. But what is important is that we are logging here. So it says print. It is the position to delete, two. This is the position to delete, two, right? So let's do it again. If we do... 1,000 and I click on send, this is the position to delete, 1,000, all right? And why does it work? Because after the slash, I do a number and the number is then captured here, all right? And then we can use it in our, in our endpoint, in our function. You see that we have position here, right? So if I remove this, it will complain. It will say, yes, but what is position? Position is not defined. Right? So I have to take position here. I have to put it here. This is what we are sending in the URL, a position. Okay? So I think that's understood. Is it clear, guys? Sweet. Perfect. All right. So cl let's click on test. Done. Boom. Let's click here. And now we got to make it a reality because 
Those positions are from one or from zero. From zero, Keith, you are very smart. Because we do have to do a little trick that we will do in this step. Is that now it says that uh, use postman or insomnia to request. Okay, to, to request. Yeah, we're already using that. So we tested it. it's working. We just tested it. But the finish the to do list. Sorry, the delete to do. This is the important one. Why? Because right now it is not doing anything useful. It's just logging the position and returning something. So that's not useful at all. We want to delete a to do at a certain position. That's what we want to do. All right. And um, and um, Keith really um, gave us a nice hint is that in programming, we start from zero. There are many, many, many few programming languages that start from one. But most of most programming languages start from zero. What does this mean? Is that you start counting from zero most of the times. That means if you have a list, you won't do like first item, second item. No, you will do something like, okay, item at zero, item at one, item at two. All right, zero is an index. Yes, you can take it like that. So if our list has two items, all right. Then what is the index of the first one? Is it zero or one? Zero. Perfect. It is zero. And what about the position? Sorry, the index of the second item? One. Correct. You got it. You got it. So let's do that. Let's do that. It says receive the position. We are doing it right here. Remove the task. Okay, so how do we do this? Very simple. So we get the JSON to do's, and this is our notation to access certain index. So if I do JSON to do's zero, then tell me guys, am I am I retrieving the first task or the second task? The first, correct, because it is it is at zero. Right. If I do at one, then I'm getting the second task. Right. So I think that's understood. So what's going on here is that people, users, don't know about this. If you present someone with a list of three items and you say, what's the position of the second item? They will tell you number two. But that's actually incorrect. It's one. Right. Because the first item is position zero, second, sorry, it's index zero, second item is one, third item is two. Okay? So the user doesn't have to know this. If the user tells us, delete the first one, you have to do the logic in order to make that happen. Luckily, it's very simple. So we do. We want to delete a, 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 a task based on the position, right? But we gotta we we gotta do it less one, right? We we gotta subtract one because we're always one step back. If the user is asking us for the first item in the list and it sends us a one, then we need to do one minus one zero. That's the index zero, the first item. Okay. So when so when we do this, in order to delete it, we do something in Python called del from delete. So it says delete from the list at this position. Okay? After we got that, then then we need to jsonify as we got it here and lastly we got to return it. Okay? So, let's run the let's run the application again because it crashed and I uh, and I run it back again. No FAC QC, making sure that the data in the array. Uh, yes, of course. And we can even go further. Like, what happens if I don't send a number? If I send gibberish, will it work? No, it won't work <laughs> because it's not a number, right? Uh, that's why we have this guard here, like int. It forces us to give a number. We can make that that test later. But yes, when you're coding in real life. Yes, when you're coding in real life, you gotta guard your code a lot, right? You gotta protect it. You gotta think about the edge cases, about the border cases. Like what happens 
if the array doesn't exist, what, what, sorry, if the list dot doesn't exist, what happens if the list is empty? What happens if I somehow send the string? What happens if it crashes? Should I send something to the user? Right, th th uh, things like that are the day-to-day -day stuff that developers have to deal with. But as of now, we, we're just going to make it simple, all right? We're just gonna pretend that whoever is dealing with, the, with this API <laughs> is smart <laughs> and it's not a baby and knows how to use it. So yes, we get the position, we subtract one, uh, we delete the element on that place, then we JSONify, Hold on, hold on. It's like this, I had a bug. I had a bug and you didn't tell me guys. You gotta pay more attention, ah, and I'm kidding. So we're going to delete it, then we're gonna JSONify, then we're gonna return it. Easy, huh? So let's go here and if we get, let's close this. If, if we get, we got two items, right? That means, that if I want to delete the first one and I click here, it will just show me that now the array, well, the list has one task, just one, right? Because I deleted the task at, at, at position one. But then we can create more like this. So hit chocolate, right? Now we got two. Let's continue. Clean, oh man, clean the house. Boom, walk the dog, walk the dog, boom. So now we got a request, sorry, we got a response with four items. If I do a get request, I'll get the four items. And if I do a delete that please delete three, and this is a test for you guys, if the user sends three, then which of this, which of these tasks is going is, is is going to be deleted? Who can answer me that? Walk the dog. Why why are you so sure? That's four. One, two, three, four. Clean the house. Correct. Machit, you were the only one that was correct. Why walk the dog, guys? We are subtracting one number. So if we are sending a three here, then in our logic, it will get to two, right? And then this is zero first, one second, two third item. Perfect, Ben. That's, that, that's the correct explanation, right? So let's do it again. If I want to delete the second one, then what's going to be deleted here? Which task is going to be deleted? Clean. Eat chocolate, correct. Jorge, no. We're going to do clean chocolate. <laughs> yes. Why? Because we are doing two, right? So that means two minus one is one. And that means that we got zero and one. This is this is the task at, at index one. Okay, guys, I think you got it now. So let's see if it works. Boom, look, there's no eat chocolate anymore. Boom, now, okay. So let's go back to the slides. I think this one is very straightforward, guys. So here, so here the city says, hey, go to the warehouse and delete the first to do. So the boat goes with that here into this port. The captain of the boat says, tells the worker, hey, I need to delete the first one. The worker goes to the warehouse and says, sure. Boom, delete it. No more first to do, right? The worker then comes back to the boat. The boat has a copy of whatever is in the warehouse and then it goes back to the city. All right, is this clear guys? Yes. Nice, sweet. Okay, so here we can uh, click on tests. Everything is expected, of course, because we are very cool. And that was our last step. If we see here, there is no next. 
we have just finished our code and this is the lasting result. So guys, if you're still here, we managed to do this together, right? And I think it's not super difficult. I don't know what you guys think. Was it too difficult? Okay. Lydia says no, but it's because you are very smart. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so that gets us, gets us to our last slide. And it says here, recap and final words, all right? So it's almost time to say goodbye, but not before some final words. Python, Python is a solid and popular programming language with a wide range of job opportunities, okay? So it's not only uh, interesting to learn it uh, as a beginner, but it also has a lot of uh, opportunities for you. Sometimes less is better. Lightweight libraries as Flask or plugins as Thunder can help us to set up a simple API in a matter of minutes. Right? You want to impress your family in Christmas? I can code an API. Camila taught me how. Just give me 15 minutes. No, no, no just give me like three minutes and I will set up something for you. An API is like a waiter. Its work is to deliver a request from a customer to the chat and then send the API and then send back the final plate to the customer. An API is usually the first thing a product builds. That's true. Last but not least, communication between front and back end must be always done in JSON. It's a universal language. So those are my final words for you guys. Do you guys have any final words for me or for, or for the group? Thank you for the session. Thank you. Thanks, Camilo. Woo. Where can you find the recording? It will be posted on YouTube. Be patient. Big thanks. Thank you for your time. For sure, my my people. Thanks. Thanks. Woo. I love it. Okay, guys. So this is the end. This is the end. Coding is not an easy task, but it sure can be learned and mastered. Practice makes perfect. Join us at 4Geeks. If you're interested in joining us, just sign up. And if you are good at timing, I might be your mentor in February, February next year, probably Miami cohort. So take that in mind if you want to stick around. Okay, guys, see you. Take care, people. Bye bye.